Now on CBS News Bay Area, we go to a quiet corner of Yosemite where a groundbreaking and risky experiment has been playing out for the past 50 years. Good evening, I'm Elizabeth Cook. And I'm Brian Yamamoto. In the early 70s, a small group of UC Berkeley researchers recognized if we didn't start allowing good fire back into our forests, we'd be putting them at risk for the mega fires we're actually seeing today. Meteorologist Darren Peck was invited along last week to see the results up close. Darren, yes. what'd you find? Well, because of that good fire and because of the inspiration of researchers at Berkeley in the 70s. Mm -hmm. This little forest, this one little patch of forest in Yosemite is probably now one of the only examples we have of what a healthy forest in the Sierra is supposed to look like. I was invited along with the researchers to see it. Here's what I saw. You have to really love the work you're doing if just getting to the office means carrying 40 pounds on your back okay. for 16 miles. I wanna know what the forest has to tell me there's just so many secrets out here and somebody has to tell their story. I've been working here for almost 20 years and I still don't really have it all figured out. Measured in O2. The story that Brandon and Alexis, two UC Berkeley researchers, are trying to figure out and share with the rest of us is what happens when naturally occurring lightning fires are allowed to burn through these forests. So you can trace through the last 50 years of fires or more. At least, look, you'll see that one right there. Then there's probably one there or, or there, and that's another one. And then the rest are all burned out. Individual fires. Yep. Since naturally occurring lightning fires have been allowed to return to the Lillooet Basin, the flow in the rivers here has increased. That's because there's less competition here now from overcrowded forests. More water in the landscape means that there are now more meadows. In fact, they've documented the meadows in the Lillooet Basin have doubled in size and number in the last 50 years of natural fire. More meadows means more wildflowers. More wildflowers means more pollinators. That's something the researchers have been thrilled to document. On this trip, Lex was trying to determine if there was an impact on the bats out here. It records everything, but it does a really good job of picking up ultrasonic sounds. But getting all these benefits means embracing the inevitability of fire on its schedule. 1974, the Star King fire. 1980, Gordo fire. Brandon can list the challenges each one of these fires presented, almost like he's talking about his kids. 2001, the Hoover fire. That was one that really tested the resolve of some of the managers to let that one burn. It had some pretty, pretty big burn days. Do you want to take a break? And as for Lex, she's got her reasons for spending more time in the field here than most researchers. I'm really proud of the kind of forest that we have here, but also recognize that we have a lot of work to do in them, and so I want to be able to be an agent of change. Both of them will tell you they are only able to do this work because of the giants at Berkeley who came before them. Specifically, these guys, Harold Biswell and his grad student, Jan. In 1970, when this picture was taken on one of the first prescribed burns in the park, they were ridiculed for being reckless. There's more risk, you know, than, than maybe there's reward, at least if you're thinking about it just from a career standpoint. But they did it. They did it because it was the right thing. And here we are benefiting from the science side of that and able to tell a really neat story about fire in this natural landscape. And about those 16 miles and 40 pound packs, for anybody who wants to see for themselves how Sierra forests can thrive over the next 50 years in an even warmer climate, come to the Alilouette Basin where you can see it for yourself today. I really like it here. <laughs> I think when I look textbook, healthy fires, this is what it looks like to me. Okay, because this is such a unique patch of Sierra Forest and because these are UC Berkeley researchers, we've got 50 years of documentation to show the results. A little key over here. It shows you what the composition of the forest was in 1969 before they started letting the lightning ignited fires go. I'm going to play this forward decade by decade and they put this series of maps together so that we can all visualize the transformation in these forests over the last 50 years. And what you see down here on this one is a complex of diversity. It's not just constant, overgrown, young, crowded pine trees. Instead, what you have are a mix of meadows and shrubland, what forests used to be in the Sierra before we started unknowingly thinking we were doing what was right, 
removing all the fires. And now, as a consequence, fire is going to happen one way or the other. And when the forests look like that, you get megafires. If the forests look like this, it's a natural defense. These forests have evolved for thousands of years without our help. And that's kind of how we've gotten into the problems that we've gotten. It was such a unique experience, guys, to be invited along with these. And this is, you know, it's a story of Yosemite, but it's also yeah. a story about our backyard. Yeah. These were researchers here at UC Berkeley. Think of it, Berkeley in the 70s. They were rebels. People yeah. thought they were nuts. <laughs> and people really... Some still do. Yeah. Some still do, but 50 years later, they're proven right. Yeah. 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 And those healthy fires are so important, but I got to say, when you see one... Just from a distance, mm -hmm. you can't help but hold your breath that that's going to stay controlled because that is the risk with these healthy it fires. Is. Yeah, that's a challenge. So I couldn't help but notice, though, that you took a little drink from the stream there. Good for you. Look at the nature boy. <laughs> you know, that was one thing most people commented on because everyone knows you got to filter the water. Yeah, no yeah. kidding. If you look real closely, I am holding a filter. In the other hand, I did filter that water. But that's oh. got to be I still the cleanest water you probably had in a long time. Though, you right? bet it was. Yeah, it's nice yeah. and refreshing. But so many people love to but go backpacking up here. The campgrounds, you never know. Yeah, you've, you've always got to filter the water. When and you're and you, you actually, I mean, what a day, nice day in the office, but you actually hiked in that full 16. It was a full 16. It was eight wow. out. We were supposed to to do five. We ended up going out eight. And then, of course, you got to go back that eight the next day. It was totally worth it. And, and, oh, so, and, yeah. and, and anyone could go visit this. Yeah. Get a wilderness permit. For that part of the park, the mm -hmm. Illilouette Basin, mm -hmm. um, it's kind of just east from Glacier Point. You look out over it. When you go to Glacier Point, in between that and the big mountains off to the east, that's all the Illilouette Basin. Oh, okay. You can get a wilderness permit. You'd have it all to yourself. Beautiful. Wow. I mean, the flowers alone were <laughs> yes. just spectacular. Yes. What a great day for you to be up there, too. Yeah, it was. It was. Thanks, right. Darren. Thanks, Darren. Great story.